Why don't we get started? It's after the hour and a lot of people have been sitting in the waiting room and there's not, we're not getting a big population of attendees at nine because of everyone's already here. Um, <clears throat> so let's get started. My name is Tim Nedwitt. I work for ExxonMobil. So if you're hearing me, you're, you might be interested in the Herder Dispersants webinar series, right? And this is week four of the series and the focus this week is on herders. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about some basic things about herders and uh, I'll just start by saying I believe that herders and their ability to enable in-situ burning um, with minimal equipment is really a step change in advance for oil spill response and I say that all the time when I talk about herders but, uh, but I believe it and hopefully when you hear the talks today you'll, uh, you'll understand why I believe um, that is the case. So just let me do a little bit of introduction and then we'll, I'm going to be the first speaker. The speakers today are myself. Um, I'm going to talk about really basics of herder use and then we're going to have Kelly McFarland talk about some of the information she's gathered on the toxicity of the herder formulations that are available um, today. And then a very, an important talk, David Cooper, Cooper with SL Ross, and I'll introduce any, each of them a little more detail as right before they talk. Um, David Cooper is going to David Cooper is going to describe about the safety of in situ burning, some of the basics of in situ burning, but the safety of how we can safely perform in situ burning with free floating oil slicks that aren't contained by a boom. Right. Um, so he'll he'll talk about that. So why are we having this webinar series? <clears throat> I've been sponsoring a webinar series through Exxon Mobil at, or not a webinar, but a workshop on dispersants at at Omset for the last couple of years. Um, we planned on having one this year uh, in June, but unfortunately the lockdown uh, didn't allow us to do that. Omset was a great facility because it had a big uh, room for uh, for a workshop that could hold 40 people. But then the the other benefit of Omset was being able to go out on the tank and uh, and actually do tests where we put oil slicks on the tank at Omset, the the 200 meter wave tank in New Jersey, put oil slicks on the tank, and then apply dispersants on them and allow people to actually see disperse oil happening in a, in a simulated wave environment that we're able to do it at OMSET. So, so we won't be able to do that on the webinar, but so that's a disadvantage, but the webinar is allowing a lot more people to attend, right? Like right now there's over hundred people. We've typically had up to 190 people on this webinar series. This is week four. Um, and so it's a way to, to communicate um, some of the information we have about dispersants primarily, but also herders is, um, this week to a lot more people than we're able to do at the at the in-person workshop and also have a wider variety of speakers, right? We were stuck, we were limited to the people that could come to to OMSET to speak um, during the in-person workshops at, at OMSET. So what we're going to do today is I'm, I, I've been running these like I would run a session at a, uh, at a conference. So I'm going to be the first speaker and I'll speak hopefully for 20 minutes or so and then we'll have I'll allow questions immediately after I speak. And the way we do questions is there, there's a Q&A button on, this, on everyone's screen, I hope. Um, and that allows you to type in your questions. <clears throat> and when, we're, when I'm done speaking, I'll look through the questions and answer the ones as many as I can in the 10 minutes or the amount of time that I have remaining. Um, once that's over, I'll, I'll pass it on and introduce Kelly and she's going to speak second and do the same thing and we'll have questions and then David and then questions after he speaks. So we're all going to speak for about 20 minutes and allow roughly, you know, five or 10 minutes for questions for each of us. Um, in the past, we've had way more questions than we could answer. Um, and so I've allowed the, the webinar to go on about 15 minutes and we've been able to get through most of the questions after 15 minutes. But in addition, we're, we're saving the questions um, and we will uh, answer the questions, you know, we'll look through all the questions again and add more detail if we think that's necessary, but the questions all, uh, are being collected and we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll send them out to the speakers and we'll answer them um, again, um, or questions that we didn't get to and I'll, I'll circulate those to everyone as well, so stay tuned for that. Um, the other thing I wanna mention is we, I do believe I'm getting uh, the powers that be inside ExxonMobil we're very data privacy is really important right now, and so there's there's a lot of kind of bureaucratic hurdles I got to go through to get recording. So we are recording these webinars, um, but to get permission internally to to allow them to be circulated is is takes a little bit of time. But I do believe I've learned the the new system that we have, and I think that's going to happen. And so um, I'll start posting just exactly how I'm going to post is a question right now, but I'll I'll, I'll allow it. 
anyone who's interested in the in the recordings to have access to have access to them. But I'll I hopefully this week I'll know the nuts and bolts. I'll figure out the nuts and bolts of that this week, and we'll be able to do that um, next. I'll, I'll be able to tell you where to go next week to get the presentations. So for those who don't know me, I'll just introduce myself, I guess. I'm gonna bring up my slides, hopefully. Where's my mouse? I don't know why isn't this working. Um, so I'm Tim Nedwood, I work for ExxonMobil and I lead the oil spill response research program. Why isn't this working? And uh, I lead the oil spill response research program for ExxonMobil. And uh, that means what I do is, hold on. Okay, sharing screen. I'm sharing my screen. Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen. Can somebody give me the thumbs up if they can? Kelly, somebody? We can see it. Okay, good. So I'm gonna give a brief introduction of of herders. Um, it's something that I've been working on. As I said, I lead the oil spill response research program. So my job is to kind of scratch my head and figure out how industry can do a better job responding to oil spills. And a major focus of my research is how we can develop tools <clears throat> that allow us to respond to large spills that might in the marine environment. So that's one of the focus areas. And herders and their ability to, na to enable in situ burning with minimal logistics and at, at the speed of a fixed wing airplane is uh, what I'm gonna talk about today. And as I said at the beginning, I believe it's a step change advance for oil spill response. Um, and this image on this, on, this picture, on this slide shows you why, right? Because we, and I'll describe this little tool that's, that's, that's got this little parachute on it. Um, but it's because we can apply it at the speed of a fixed wing airplane, right? So as fast as we can get out there. In the past, dispersants have been the only tool that we could apply at the speed of a fixed wing airplane, but herders will allow us to do in situ burning at the speed of a fixed wing airplane. So speed is the key for oil spill response. That's why I argue that it's a step change advance for oil spill response. Okay, so this is what I'm gonna talk about. I'll give a quick background on in situ burning and I think, I think I'll go over it quickly. Um, and on all of my slides, I believe I have references that you can look at and my slides will be available so you can go and get more information. Um, but I think there'll be more detail on a lot of the things I'm gonna talk about. So I'll go through things quickly just to introduce it. And I think the additional talks by Kelly and, and David will give a little bit more information. But I'm gonna give a brief background on in situ burning so we're all on the same page on how it's performed and some of the concerns with it. Then I'll talk about herders, you know, how they work, and some of the, you know, we've been, I've been working on herders since the early 2000s, right? So there's a long history of research, and there's a lot that's been done, and I'll briefly highlight that so you know that, that, that we've been doing our due diligence to understand how herders work and where they can be applied. And then there's been some important recent advances in the last two or three years on herders, not, not the use of herders, but the, the ability to apply herders and that little system that I showed on that first on the first slide is is kind of the key thing that's allowed us to go from um, kind of directly without a lot of development to a, a system that can be rapidly applied with a fixed wing Hellcraft and that's that's this remotely operated surface vehicle and I'll describe that on a, at the end. So quick quick background on in situ burning. In situ burning is is has been studied for oil spill response for a long period of time. The challenge with it should you burning is that oil slicks are naturally almost all oils, crude oils and fuel oils will spread too thin to sustain combustion. You actually need insulation from the oil slick itself um, to allow the fire from the burn to generate additional volatiles to allow the, the burn to continue, right? And so oil, most oils will spread much less than a millimeter thick at, on the open ocean. And that's too thin, right? Not enough insulation from the oil slick. So you have to thicken the oil slick and that's why you need fire resistant booms, which is the traditional way that, that in-situ burning has been done. Um, but with herders, we can do that. We can thicken oil slicks with a surfactant and we don't need a physical boom um, to do it. So to get burns to happen, the oils must ha can't have weathered beyond the point where volatiles can be produced, right? And these are volatiles that can be produced with the heat of the burn, right? So there's uh, so there's a lot of things. So the typical volatiles that might come off an oil slick 
can be lost, but with the heat of the burn produces additional volatiles, um, but they can't be gone or you won't be able to sustain combustion. You can't have an emulsion that's too heavy, right? So there can't be too much water because you lose too much heat to the boiling of the water that would be in the emulsion to, to generate additional volatiles, right? So there is a window of opportunity um, for in situ burning regardless, right? Whether or not you're using booms or you're using um, herders. <clears throat> I put this next bullet up here because it's important to understand. Again, uh, there's references on all these things, but and there was an important study done, in a field program done in 1993 called the Newfoundland Oil Burn Experiment, or NOBI. Um, and I, I'd encourage you, if you're interested in in situ burning, going back and looking at the papers that were published. There's a lot of papers in IOC. There's a report that you can get from Environment Canada, I believe. Um, describing the details of that, but that was the most instrumented and well and studied um, offshore field test with in situ burning. And I always there's always questions about in situ burning about the toxicity of the burn residue and the smoke plume, right? So there's always going to be a burn residue because you're going to burn down to where there's less than a millimeter of residue left, and uh, you won't sustain combustion until you leave. There's always going to be a burn residue, right? If you do it right. Even with herders, you can get 90 plus percent burn efficiency. There's always gonna be this residue. Fortunately, the burn residue, the toxic components, most of the toxic components in an oil are also the volatile components, especially when you heat things up. And so those volatiles get consumed in the burn, right? So the residue tends to become less toxic, is less toxic, and that was proven during the, the field experiment in the, with the NOBI experiment um, as well. And there's other experiments that have shown that. Um, but And the smoke plume is a concern, right? The, this is a very inefficient way. You can't get oxygen to the center of a, of a, a free-floating oil slick that's burning, so it gets oxygen starved in the middle, so you produce soot. The primary concern with the smoke plume is not toxic components, because I said they get burned. Um, they get consumed in the burn, but it's soot particles because of the inefficient uh, burn. Um, and it's this particles that are 2.5 microns that tend to be, if you inhale those, they can get lodged in your in your um, lungs. Um, but if you go, dilution is very rapid in the open, in the air, in the open ocean. And so if you, if you are a safe distance downstream and the NOBI um, papers say that 500 meters downstream, but a safety factor of two or three kilometers means that if you are that far downstream, the concentration of those particles have diluted so much that it's generally not considered a health concern. I won't talk about, I highlighted this just or I, 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 sh I show these Lex bullets with a little, <clears throat> a little lighter font, so because uh, they're going to be here, so you can look at it. But, but I believe David's going to talk about some of this stuff on the efficiency and situ burning on in his talk, so I won't go over it here. Um, so now herders, what are herders? So these two graphics on the on the right here kind of help me explain uh, herders in situ burning. This is the upper graphic here shows you kind of the traditional way of doing in situ burning where you need fire boom, right? And this is an ocean going boom, right? It's not standard um, oil boom. It is fire resistant boom, which means it's heavy pieces of equipment because it has to be able to sustain the, uh, the energy of a, you know, 1500 degree Fahrenheit or more burn, right? And so it can't just be standard boom. It has to be heavy fire resistant boom. With herders, we get rid of almost all of this equipment, right? And I show, this is an old graphic that I generated several years ago, but I show herders being applied by a helicopter. So what are herders? Herders are surface collecting agents, right? So you'll see in these slides that I use surface collecting agents or herders, um, but they are fundamentally a surfactant. So for when I say SCAs, it's the same thing as herder, right? I'm using them as synonyms. Um, but it is a surfactant, and it's much like the surfactant you'd have in your soap in your soap or shampoos or detergents that you'd use at home. In fact, if you wanna see herders act, you can go home and get a cake pan of tap water, put some vegetable oil in it, and then drop a couple drops of liquid um, soap detergent onto the water surface next to that um, <clears throat> vegetable oil, and you'll see this herding action happen in your kitchen, right? The herders change the surface tension of the water around the perimeter of an oil and cause it to behave differently and actually contract into a smaller area. So a very small amount of herders, because eventually a monomolecular layer is all that's needed, can be sprayed on the water surface around the perimeter slick, which I'm trying to show in this drawing here. Um, and it causes the slick to kind of magically come into a smaller area and therefore thicken. And so if you, can, if you compare the use of herders or SCAs to if we were gonna disperse the same oil slick, <clears throat> 
you need at least an order of magnitude and maybe two or more orders of magnitude less of the surfactant to, to herd an oil slick compared to if you were going to disperse um, the oil slick. This next item here, this next thing on the list is um, that herders were originally, they've been around a long time. Garrett and Berger did research for the US Navy lab back in the 19, early, late 1960s and early 1970s. And they were developing herders for, to enhance mechanical recovery without using booms. And there's a variety of reasons, but it's, it's just not efficient when you don't have a really thick slick or you, have, you don't have an oil slick that's contained by boom. Um, skimmers don't work very well. So in, in the, Garrett Berger did that work in the early 1970s to develop a more efficient way of doing mechanical recovery. In the 2000s, we brought herders back off the shelf um, and looked at them as a tool to enable in-situ burning because in-situ burning is, can be very fast, right? It can take just tens of minutes or less to get to burn a very large oil slick. <clears throat> Our work in the early 2000s focused on marine applications with ice because we were focused on industry developments in, in cold regions and the Arctic. Um, but almost all of that research and the research that was done by Garrett and Barger and others early on was done in open water. And the research even in the ice environment research that we did was most of that research was done with open open water. So it is not an ice environment. It is not a tool that's restricted to ice environments, a tool that can be applied in open water. And that's why it's an important tool because it's it can be broadly applied. It can work just as well on the equator as it can work in open water or, or water that's only slightly ice covered in, in the Arctic. So the goal of this herder work that we've been doing all this time is to make another tool that can be rapidly applied at, by air, right? By a helicopter, and then with the remotely operated surface vehicle that we're developing now, it can be rap rapidly applied at the speed of a fixed wing airplane, right? Uh, and so then it can be applied as fast as any other, any other tool. So that gives us the, the ability to do things quickly with dispersants, which can be applied by fixed wing airplane and, and herders now. So, as I said, there's over 15 years of research. We've done several field tests on herders. Um, I mentioned how most of, its, most of that research was done under temperate um, conditions. I, 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 the font for this next bullet here is, is uh, a little bit lighter because I'm not gonna go into the details of that because um, Kelly's gonna talk about that. One thing that's important, and I think there needs to be more research on this, but Garrett and Berger did a field test in the 1970s, early 1970s, um, at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay, if you can imagine that. And they put oil slicks out on, at the mouth of Chesapeake Bay <clears throat> and sprayed herders around it. And it's actually the same herder that we're using today. Um, and they were able to keep that slick herded in six foot seas with numerous white caps for two and a half hours. Um, that may not be enough time under those conditions to do mechanical recovery of a large slick, um, but it is plenty of time, as we'll describe, to do in situ burning, right? So the reason I put that bullet up there is because it may be that the window of opportunity for in situ burning is actually quite large, right, in sea, as, as, as regards to sea states, right? It doesn't require calm seas or seas without breaking waves. Garrett and Berger proved that they were able to maintain a slick, herded slick that would be burnable for, for over two and a half hours in the sea. <clears throat> we have two slick, two herder formulas that are available on the EPA's national priority list right now. Um, one is called Thick Slick <clears throat> and the other is called OP40. I won't go into the details of that, what was done to get things listed because Kelly's going to talk about that. But just be aware that two herders <clears throat> are available for use in waters of the United States if the decision is made during a spill to use them. <clears throat> so this is one of the first tests that we did on herders um, <clears throat> many years ago. This is Ian Buist. He works for SL Ross, the same company that David Cooper works for now. And it was really his idea to bring herders off the shelf and use them for in-situ burning because he knew about herders. He's been in this business a long time. Um, but then he also is an expert on in-situ burning and knew that bringing those two things together could lead to something important. This video shows Alaska North Slope and a little test basin that we made out of two by fours with some plastic sheeting to keep the water in. There's a couple inches of seawater in this tank. And then this Alaska North Slope has spread to an equilibrium thickness that would be too thin to burn. <clears throat> we were on an indoor basin, so we couldn't do burning here, but this video just shows you the action of the herder. So Ian has a little syringe in his hand. As I said, it just takes a small amount of stuff. You can see in the video, this is real time. 
the herder doing its job, right? It's moving. The surfactants in this herder are, have a chemical force to go across the surface and find additional surface area because that's a low energy state for them. Um, and by doing that, they're changing the surface tension of the water. That's why the slick is kind of magically coming together into a thinner area. And you can see that it is quite rapid. Right? You can see the slick coming together. And the estimates are that the slick is at least five times thinner than it was before. And based on what we knew about the volume of oil that was put out there and the amount of surface area that the slick has at the end, um, the slick was probably at least five millimeters thick, which means it was plenty thick to ignite and combust. And we've done many tests at small scale with actual ignition. And what we find is that a, a five millimeter slick burns down to one millimeter and we get roughly 80% um, burn efficiency at this small scale in a, in a, in a closed kind of mesoscale test like we would have done here. As I said, we didn't burn this one because we're indoors, but tests that we've done outdoors. What we found, and I don't, I have video of it, but I, in, in, because of time limits here, I'm not gonna show that. But when we do a field test with hundreds of liters of oil, we find that there's a chimney effect that happens and the burn efficiency in the field is actually greater than we get in the lab. And so even a three millimeter thick slick, we might believe it would burn down to one millimeter and extinguish, but there's a herding action because of the convective currents that are feeding the fire that causes um, additional herding. And so we believe that during a burn, when, it's full, when, a, when a slick is fully engulfed, that, this, that the oil becomes at, at least maybe 10 millimeters thick, right? And then that burns down to one millimeter because the estimates from field tests indicate that uh, over 90% burn efficiency has happened. So I mentioned we've done field tests there's been a, there's a field test done by Cintef in, the, in 2008 and 2009 in, in basically open water that proved herders. We did testing at a large tank in, uh, in 2015 in Fairbanks, Alaska, where we successfully demonstrated an aerial application system and ignition system. And then in 2016, we went offshore during a test that was sponsored by NOFO um, and applied herders. And I think David's gonna talk about this a little bit more, applied herders in open water. You can see this is a herded slick the clear water here, this is sheen from that slick. The clear water here is the, is the oil that was herded together to form this thick band of oil that we successfully burned in the field test in 2016. So more recently, we've had oil spill response organizations are developing capacity. MSRC has a stockpile, Clean Gulf Associates has a stockpile, and OSRL is developing, a stock, is, is evaluating um, herders um, as we speak and is and hopefully we'll be developing a stockpile and their stockpiles allow them to do kind of test um, burns during an inc during an actual incident which is I think what we need to do next to prove herders test them during an actual incident and so they have the capabilities to apply herders from boats um, similar to what we did in offshore um, Norway in 2016 uh, to small slicks and show that herders can work during actual incidents. So there is interest and oil spill response organizations are developing capabilities. So more recently, we have, we've developed a joint industry slash government. So uh, project BESI in the United States is, is a part of that. And there are several oil companies that are part of that project. And, and um, Alaska Oil Spill Recovery Institute is, is really sponsoring and, and running the project for us. Um, but the goal of that project is to develop a rapid herder delivery ignition system. And that's the remotely operated surface vehicle which is really a remotely operated jet ski that allows us to spray herder and ignite slicks. And I'll show you the details of that. Um, I mentioned this Chevron drill that happened in 2019. Um, we didn't get endorsement. So herders were, um, we attempted during a drill in the Gulf of Mexico to get endorsement for using herders. And I mentioned this because it's important to understand that they did not give endorsement. So the, the stakeholders did not give endorsement for herders as a trial in that drill, right? It's just a drill. Um, because they were concerned about the safety of free floating oil slicks and burning oil, free floating oil that wasn't contained in an area with a lot of oil and gas equipment in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, <clears throat> and the, but they're also concerned that herders weren't shown to be effective in temperate environments in the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico. And both of those things, we've done a lot of research. David's going to talk about the safety of burning free floating oil slicks. As I mentioned, most of the research on herders have been done in temperate environments, but a lot of the recent literature over the last 10 years or so has described how herders are designed for, for Arctic environments because that's what we originally brought them back off the shelf to do. But in fact, most research on herders has been done in temperate, under temperate conditions. And I mention this because hopefully next year we are 
We will be doing a field test with our remotely operated surface vehicle to apply herders and ignite herded slicks. Um, but the Canadians are doing this multi-partner research initiative next summer, and we hope to test herders with our system then. So quickly, I wanted to show, so this is where we are with herder development, right? We are developing, we have taken an off-the-shelf jet ski, it's called a sea Dew Spark. We've taken the top side off and we've built our own top sides and we've put the equipment in it to allow it to spray herder and to basically as a flamethrower to allow it to, to spray gel, ignited gelled gasoline onto the herded slick to allow it um, to ignite. So this is kind of a one-stop thing. Um, it's being built to allow us to drop it from a ship, drop it from a helicopter, or we're putting a kind of a dragster um, parachute on it so we can drop it from an airplane, right? So it can be immediately any of those systems that has the capability uh, and has a door that allows it to, to this system, um, which is about a what, two or three feet wide, maybe three feet wide, that allows it to be jettisoned out of that, be out of that airplane, it can be a system that can apply herders without having to go through all the FAA rules that we might have to go through if we were going to put nozzles and deliver and spray equipment on the outside of it. This thing's going to be an autonomous remotely operated thing so there can be an autonomous operator or we can put waypoints in it through GPS and have it go to where we want it to go. Um, so that means the operator can be kind of anywhere. Um, we're going to have several different potential ways of communicating with it, including satellite communications, which really means it's flexibility of where the, the operator can be. That means the operator can be somebody who's an expert on doing this, right? Hurting and burning. Um, and he doesn't have to necessarily be in the theater of the spill. These, this jet ski off the shelf has kind of quite a good capacity for speed, assuming the, the uh, mid ocean conditions allow that. It can go quite fast. And it has a huge range of 500 miles and, and 12 hours of operation at speed. Um, that's with off the shelf. When you take the hole off and you look inside it, uh, when you take the top side off and look inside the hole, there's a lot of volume in there. So we know we are planning to put additional fuel cells in that thing. So we believe that we can probably have that thing continuously operating for multiple days, if not a week or more. So it's going to have the herder application system. It has, it's this, this, this jet ski has the capacity to hold three men on it, right? So it has a good payload capacity. We're building it with a collision avoidance system that allows it to go, it's gonna be autonomous or even remotely, you know, fly, going to waypoints that it's given, um, but we don't want it to run into any kind of debris that would be in the water, and God forbid a, a marine mammal or something else. It has a collision, off the shelf collision avoidance system that allows it to see a floating tire that's two miles ahead, right? So, and it will be able to take action to avoid running into things. It's the key to doing in situ, or to do spraying herders is to have the right view down onto the oil slick. If you're at the wrong angle on the water, looking at where oil is, you're not gonna see it. So we have a tethered unmanned aerial vehicle <clears throat> that will sit in a hangar, so it will be a retractable tether to allow uh, HD cameras to go up into the air and give you a view because you need to carefully apply the herder to the water surface and not overspray onto the oil slick. And there's other things, and there's other things that we're potentially gonna be adding to the system um, as it evolves. So I put this on here because uh, it cost me a lot of money to develop these uh, graphics from our graphics department, uh, but also it shows you the important things, right? Um, I believe that herders, that this remotely operated service vehicle, because it can do this active oil spill response, but also because it is a very powerful, and I didn't talk about all the details, but it's a powerful remote sensing platform that it can allow any vessel that goes offshore to send it out as a scout ahead of it to do the job of finding where oil slicks are and then staying with oil slicks over time to allow once a vessel gets out there and decides what its tactics are gonna be for that response to be ready with the information on the characteristics of an oil slick. But it's being outfitted with the capability to go on a helicopter and as I mentioned on a fixed wing aircraft. So I'll just quickly show this. This, hopefully this video shows, this is the prototype that we had last October. Right, that's 10% throttle. It has the ability to actually break. You see it go nose down, it can reverse thruster so it can be soft. This is the way it looks like. These are the additional tanks that we've put inside the thing to hold additional fuel and herders and other things. So that's the prototype as it existed. It has been, it has been evolving since then, so it's gonna look something different uh, when we have it ready to be tested um, in Canada next summer. It's gonna have its own kind of comms trailer. This is the trailer we purchased for it. The vendor right now, the vendor is Tactical Electronics, which is a company out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. They're named for it because it goes out and does its own thing on its own. It's Nomad. Um, two of these things will be able to fit in this trailer. 
um, and then the trailer will, will act as the uh, as the uh, command center for it with flat screen TVs and laptops and computers to allow the operations to happen within, from within that trailer. So I'll stop there. Um, you can see the summary. We have done a lot of research on herders over the time. Our field and lab test demonstrates they work in open temperate water. <clears throat> Burning is very fast. I think David will talk about that a little bit more. It requires a very small volume, and Kelly will talk about this, but a very low toxicity surfactant, so it has good environmental characteristics. The uh, herders are commercially available. Um, Desmi is the vendor for, if you want a stockpile of herders right now, and there's the two that are on the EPA's National Contingency Plan product schedule. And right now we're de developing this jet ski based system. Um, it's in final development. We hope to test it in the basin that we have in Alaska in the spring of 2021 and do the field demonstration in the summer of, of 2021. Oil spill response organizations have stockpiles of igniters and herders right now, and so it is ready um, for first use via boat-based application, and hopefully when we prove it in 2021 that we'll have this really rapid system to apply herders and ignite slicks. So with that, I'll stop, and maybe we have I've gone a little bit over. We'll have time for uh, uh, some questions. So let me look at the questions here. So hold on. Um, okay, so first question here. Currently in Europe, in situ burning is still a bit of a taboo. So I'd be interested to know whether herders can also be beneficial for mechanical recovery operations with boom and or sweeping arms. So I would, I so as I said, herders that were tested for mechanical recovery, developed for mechanical recovery originally, what they found when they went out and did these field tests is that if you didn't have the oil slick contained by a boom, which meant it stayed in the re same relative position to the boat, right? You still have to skim the oil up and put it into a container on a boat. Um, that, that mechanical recovery was so inefficient offshore that they never actually did it. They never did it during an actual spill um, because number one, the slicks were moving and the boat had no control over it. So they had to reposition the skimmer and it made it inefficient. But the other thing is that skimmers are designed for oil slicks that are say multiple inches, if not a foot thick at the apex of a boom that's fully loaded with oil, an oil slick can be actually multiple feet um, thick. So skimmers in that kind of environment can skim very quickly and be very efficient. Herders only make the oil slick a few millimeters thick, right? And that means that not only do you have this repositioning problem for a free floating oil slick, but you also have the skimmer just not operating as quickly, and, right? And so the herding action is not permanent. Um, you have tens of minutes before the herders start losing their action and the slicks actually relax and go back to the way they were. Um, that's a problem for mechanical recovery, especially when it becomes less efficient. It's not a problem for in situ burning because it happens so quickly. Uh, so I got an FYI. OSRL is working closely with me on looking to have thick slick herder as part of their response capability. They're also looking at the feasibility of having thick slip approved for use in UK waters. So you can talk, con this is from Rob Holland with OSRL. You can contact me or him if you want to know more about their applications. Uh, okay, do the use of herders eliminate the need for fire resistant boom? Yes, I mean, you really defeat the purpose if you have to take boom out there. Boom, fire resistant boom is heavy, requires cranes to move around. Um, and so the logistics of putting fire resistant boom are the reason that in situ burning is, on in -situ burning has only been an operational tool during a real spill one time. For an offshore marine spill, it's only been an operational tool one time, and that is during the deep water horizon. It's because of the unique characteristics of that allowed the time needed for the to get boom out there. All other spills, it hasn't been operational. And one of the main reasons is just the logistics of getting fire resistant boom from its stockpile location offshore in a time um, that allows burning to be to happen before the oil has done things and gone into a form that makes it more challenging. Uh, next question, how do offshore environmental conditions, particularly sea state and wind, affect the effectiveness of herders or the herding action? I, I mentioned that and I think that's an area for research. This is going to be the last question I need to move on, but we need to do more research because surfactants on the surface of water change the relationship between the wind and the water, right? And so there is evidence that uh, breaking waves are less, uh, occur less frequently, so breaking waves are less frequent. In an environment, in an oil, in a marine environment that's covered with surfactants. 
So it's breaking waves that would break up this monomolecular layer that's very fragile, which would cause the herding action to stop and the host licks to go again. But in fact, the surfactants from the herders may protect themselves from that action. As I said, Garrett and Berger kept a slick thickened with herders for two and a half hours in six foot ways with numerous white caps. Um, so there is evidence that it happens. I'm gonna move on now and we'll go on to Kelly and we'll, we'll maybe we'll answer some of these questions, but again, I'll, I'll collect these questions and try to answer them and send them out to, to you during a spread, uh, in the spreadsheet that we have. So I'm going to stop sharing and allow Kelly to, to bring up her slides and I will introduce Kelly quickly. So Kelly works for ExxonMobil and she's been with us for two years. She's an environmental scientist at, at, with ExxonMobil Biomedical Sciences, which is in um, Clinton, New Jersey right now. She's been studying the fate and effects of oil and dispersed oil for 12 years. Her, her master's and PhD were on uh, uh, fate and effects of, of oil and dispersed oil. Um, the majority of her research was focused on Arctic environments. She received her master's in environmental engineering from a combination of Michigan Technology University and the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and she received her PhD in environmental microbiology from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Prior to joining ExxonMobil, she spent time working for Syntef in Norway. So I'll leave, turn it over to you, Kelly. Can, uh, can you hear me and can you see my slide? Okay. I see your slide and I can hear you. Okay, great. So thank you everybody for joining today. I'm gonna to talk about um, some toxicity tests on herders. The outline of my talk includes um, just some, I'm gonna go over the typical herders used in oil spill response, their structures and physiochemical properties, their biodegradation potential, mm -hmm. The, the, we have, um, I'm gonna go through the aquatic hazard data we found in the literature, and then a short uh, a screening exposure risk assessment. And then some uh, conclusion and talk about our next steps here. <clears throat> so in order for products to be used in oil spill response, they must be on the US National Oil and Hazardous Substance Pollution Contingency Plan kind of a big mouthful, so uh, we call it the NCP. This, uh, this list is maintained by the US EPA, and the list contains um, various control devices and substances that may be used to remove or control oil discharges. The list includes over uh, 19 dispersants, 28 different bioremediation agents. These include enzyme additives and nutrient additives. Two surface collecting agents. This is just another word for herders. Over 58 surface washing agents. And then the list also includes miscellaneous oil spill control substances. So the two herders on the list, which will be the subject of, of my talk today, are Siltec OP40 and Thick Slick 6535. The composition of these substances is, is not shared on the website, but uh, for these herders, uh, the composition is, is known. Um, on the NCP website, there, there are results for effectiveness and toxicity testing, as this is required for listing on the product. Um, so if, if you're interested in that data, um, just go to the website. It's important to note that just because you know these products do pass effectiveness tests, it does not actually indicate that the product is going to be effective during an oil spill. So listing you know on the NCP does not actually indicate that the device or the substance will actually be used during an oil spill. It's just the first step for it to be used. So here is the composition of the of two oil spill response herders, Siltec OP and Thick Slick 6535. So Siltec OP40 is made entirely of ethoxylated heptamethyl triciloxane. You can see the cast number and the formula and the molecular weight of that. Thick Slick 6535 is a non-ionic surfactant, which consists of two components. 65% of sorbitan monolaureate, which is also known as SPAN20. This is a fatty ester surfactant. And then the rest, 
consist of an aliphatic alcohol solvent um, called 2-ethyl-1-butanol. I wanted to include a slide to show you the structures of these components. Um, here's a structure of Siltec OP40. Um, previously, it was also known as Silsurf A004-UP. Um, so here you can see uh, the silicone here and then the ethoxylated chain. Thick slick 6535 um, has also been called USN. And here is the chemical structure of the, the span 20 and then the 2-ethyl-1-butanol. This is a table of the physical properties and environmental fate of the herder ingredients. Some of these values are predicted using EpiSuite, um, and some of them are actually measured values. So the measured values are indicated with, with some asterisks here. Uh, in, in comparison to, well, first of all, I guess I'll go through this table a little bit. So um, here we have the, the log KOW, the water solubility, uh, the vapor pressure, and um, if the ingredient is readily biodegradable or not. Um, kind of a prediction of uh, primary biodegradation here, um, you know, the, the time frame on which it occurs. So primary biodegradation refers to the initial oxidation <clears throat> on that parent molecule. And then ultimate biodegradation uh, refers to the complete breakdown to carbon dioxide and, and water. <clears throat> so if, if we look at the, the water solubility first here, uh, the, in comparison to the Siltec, Thick Slick 6535 has a, has a higher water solubility. Um, but a lower octanol water partitioning coefficient. Um, th these, these two are, are, are pretty much correlated. Um, thick slick is considered to be readily biodegradable and measured and predicted values indicate that thick slick um, has a higher biodegradation potential compared to Siltec with complete uh, biodegradation occurring within days to weeks compared to Siltec, which um, complete biodegradation is occurring on the range to, to months. So based on the, the log KOW, thick slick is expected to exhibit lower aquatic toxicity than Siltec. And then when we look at the, the vapor pressure here, the, the surfactant components um, are predicted to exhibit low volatility. Um, while the, the alcohol, 2-ethyl-1-butanol, um, um, has a much higher vapor pressure. So we did a, a we conducted a thorough literature review uh, to determine the aquatic toxicity of Siltec OP40 and Thick Slick 6535. Um, through our literature review, we looked through uh, peer-reviewed journal publications, technical reports, government reports, safety data sheets. We do even have some uh, hot off the press unpublished data here from the Huntsman's lab. Um, and then we also um, use some read across to other substances with, with similar chemical structures. So these next four slides are gonna uh, kind of document um, all data that we found in the literature. And then, you know, after these, these four tables, I'm gonna show you the a plot with the range of the, the data, the range of the LC. 50s, the EC50s, so you can see for a better comparison. So I know this is kind of a, a, a lot to show you, but really just want, I just wanted to um, show you everything that we found, uh, kind of a, a, a high overview here. So, so each row uh, indicates a, a different toxicity test that we found and shows the organism, its common name, the effect endpoint, and what was the test duration, the, the result of the test, the LC50 or the EC50, you know, and, and then, then the reference. So for Siltec OP40, you know, we, we found, you know, three different tests on fish. We found tests on crustacean, shrimp, copepod, and algae. For Thick Slick 6535, um, we found, again, we found some tests with fish, shrimp, crustaceans, copepod, and, and only one, one for algae. <clears throat> For the for 2-ethyl-1-butanol, 
we only actually found one toxicity test um, conducted on the substance 2-ethyl-1-butanol and it was for algae. But we did discover toxicity data uh, for compounds that had similar structure to 2-ethyl-1-butanol. Um, so we, we included these uh, as read across. So this is the last table here. <clears throat> So this is back to measured data. Um, this is measured data for the SPAN 20, the Sarbatan monolaureate. We only found one test for fish, one test for copepod, but we did find three different tests for algae. Okay, so this, these figures actually summarize the, the aquatic um, toxicity data that was shown in, in the previous four tables. Um, so here is the LC50 values for Siltec OP40 and then Thixlic 6535. Um, note the different, the different axes here. You know, these numbers are a lot lower than here for Thixlic. And then the two components of Thixlic, the 2-ethyl-1-butanol and the, the SPAN20. So if you compare the LC50s for Thixlic to Siltec OP40, um, the aquatic hazard of Thixlic um, is lower than Siltec OP40 due to the higher values of LC50. And then if you, if you look at the components of Thixlic, the, the 2-ethyl-1-butanol and the, and the SPAN20, the, the toxicity of Thixlic, even, even though you know, it's minimal toxicity, um, it is uh, dictated by the surfactant um, more, than, more than the solvent. Um, and this is shown by the, by the lower LC50 values of the surfactant. <clears throat> um, we did find that these trends in toxicity uh, with these LC50 values is consistent with estimated log KOW values. Um, and this is important. Um, I'll explain to you later um, on our kind of what we're doing here for our, for our next steps. So, okay, so what are we in order to put these data um, into context it's it's really important to to determine the the likely concentration of herders in the water column after after herder application so herders are applied at uh, a field application rate of uh, f or field application of five liters per kilometer <clears throat> and at a spray width of of one one meter width so for the sake of this exposure assessment calculation, we're gonna assume um, an instantaneous mixing um, in the one meter um, depth of the ocean. So this is actually quite conservative because it really doesn't take into account any decline in concentration in that upper one meter um, due to mixing um, dispersion and, and dilution of the herders. Okay. <clears throat> but if we take the, the field application of five liters um, per kilometer and we multiply that by one over the, the width of the spray, uh, multiply that by one over the, the depth of the water column on um, which the herder is going into, and we multiply all that by the product density, um, that'll give us a conservative estimate of the concentration of herder you know, in that upper one meter portion of the water column. So. Uh, our consider conservative estimate of that concentration is 4.8 milligrams per liter. So, so now let's compare that back to the LC50 values that, that we found in the literature. So in, in summary, those values that we found in, in the literature um, for Siltec OP40 range from 0 0.9 to 6.8 milligrams per liter. And then the uh, toxicity values for thick slick 6535, you know, range between 2.5 and 403 milligrams per liter. And then from that previous slide, we calculated a, a predicted concentration of, of herder in that upper one meter uh, to be 4.8 milligrams per liter. So this number, you know, is within the, the range of, of these toxicity values and, and does suggest that there, there may be some, some minor toxicity, but you really need to take into account um, the dilution that occurs in the water column. So, you know, this 4.8, this, this represents, you know, the initial maximum concentration, um, you know, that occurs initially. But 
but you know that concentration is going to be rapidly diluted um, within an hour especially. So we did find some field measurements of herder concentrations and I think it's important to, to bring that into context here. So in, the, in a basin experiment in the water column, after you an in situ burn, measure herder concentrations, you know, range from less than one microgram to, per liter to 22.7 micrograms per liter. So if we take that into account uh, with, uh, with the values that we found in the literature and the dilution that we expect to occur, the, the expected risks to aquatic life you know, under these field exposures are expected to, to be quite low. So you know, what, are we gonna, what are we gonna do from here? Well, what we hope to do with this data is uh, develop water quality objectives to support you know, herder risk assessment. So the first thing that we wanna do here is to define some species sensitivity distributions, some SSDs for herders and, and their components as well. And we plan to do this using two independent approaches. Um, first, we're going to use a US EPA's um, ICE model. It's a, called the Interspecies Correlation Extrapolation Model. This model uses you know, limited toxicity data to estimate toxicity for untested species. So it's a good way to estimate toxicity when, when you only have you know, maybe a small amount of data available. Um, so we also plan to uh, do you develop SSDs using the target lipid model, the TLM, and this will allow us to uh, predict SSDs you know, based on uh, partitioning properties of the, the, herder, the herders and, and their components. So this doesn't actually use toxicity data, it uses the properties of the, of the constituents. So once we derive these SSDs, we're then able to derive a, an HC5, so this is the fifth percentile of the hazard concentration, and this is where we can get the, the water quality objective from. So this, provide, this provides a concentration that is intended to provide a 95% protection level you know, under constant exposure conditions. So once we generate HG5s using, using these two methods, then we're going to compare them and see if they actually um, are comparative to empirical HG5s calculated with empirical data as well. So this will come into handy um, when toxicity data is hard to find, and maybe we can actually use the, the ICE model or the TLM approach to, to calculate aquatic toxicity data. All right, that's, that's all I have, and uh, hopefully I didn't go too much over for you. No, that was great, Kelly. Perfect timing. We have, we have plenty of time for some questions. If somebody wants to type in a question, I'll relay them to Kelly, and uh, while that's happening, I'll start, Kelly. Uh, there's a question that I got about uh, natural surfactants and the ability for them to be used as herders. Did your, uh, did your literature review, have you come across any uh, literature describing um, natural surfactants and do you have any thoughts on kind of how they might compare from kind of a toxicity environmental fate to, to the, to the uh, herders that we have available now? Yeah, that really wasn't the, the focus here. I really kind of uh, focused, you know, on on the two herders that you know were on were on the the NCP, the Thick Slick, and then the Siltec. Um, you know, but this question gets brought up a lot with just um, <clears throat> with dispersants in general as well. So I, I think you know I think they have, they have potential in general. But one thing that we always need to you know keep in mind is is just logistics, and you know and availability of these, of these biosurfactants as, as well <clears throat> and, and mass producing them. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, we get the same <clears throat> question about, you know, natural surfactants used for uh, dispersants and, mm -hmm. you know, green, they're greener, but uh, I think, and especially herders, since even less herders are less, you know, use 10 times or 100 times less herder than you would if you're gonna disperse something with dispersants, Dispersant oil slick with dispersants, and at least the thick slick is is ten times less toxic. So, kind of from an objective position, there's such small amount, and it's very biodegradable. Um, so that combined with the challenges of manufacturing natural surfactants in an efficient way, and kind of the uncertainty of how stable they'll be over time, makes it quite challenging to 
I think to, for those for those types of products to displace um, the ones that we've done a lot of research on and that we know kind of their long-term stability and things like that, and that we can manufacture them, especially if we ever needed it in a real emergency and had to manufacture them on the fly, um, that we can do it, right? And these other products that, you know, natural products, there's just some questions about that right now. Uh, let's see. Okay, we got a question on the target lipid model. How does one determine the lipid content? There are several different lipid extraction methods for marine organisms. Any thoughts on that, Kelly? I, you know, I'm not exactly, I don't know the inner workings of the model, but you know, the, the, we're not measuring the lipid content per se. We're actually um, basing that on the, on the log KOW. I don't know, Tom, Tom Parkinson is, 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 uh, has a lot of experience with the TLM. Does, Tom, is there anything that you, I don't know if you can actually speak, but yeah, Tom is, maybe you wanted to, to add Tom is to I, I think we the inner workings of the TLM? Yeah, I think it's an estimate of, of how the, uh, these different products were petitioned based on their KOW, right? And so there's not any kind of lipid content, right? Yeah, yeah, we're just using a lot of KOW there. Okay, well, that's great. I think we need to move on to make sure we have time. So Kelly's released her screen and I'll let David pull up his slides while I introduce um, David Cooper. Thanks, Kelly. That was great. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening. All right, so David Cooper has a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering. That means he's a really smart guy because I say chemical engineering is about the hardest degree there is to get. And he got yeah. that degree from the University of Ottawa. Um, 30, he has 30 years of experience, he says, with an eek exclamation park in the note he sent to me and spill response and alternative energy. Uh, he says that it feels like 50 years because of the lockdown this summer, unfortunately. Um, he's done hundreds of bench scale burns, tens of mid and mesoscale burns, and he's been involved and he was involved with me in the NOFO experiment that we did in 2016. So he's done a few field scale burns, so he has a lot of experience on, on this question of both herders and in-situ burning. Right now he splits his time between his home office and his, his SL Ross's lab where they have a bunch of interesting toys. If you ever get a chance to go to Ottawa, I'd recommend you try to talk to those guys and get a tour of their facilities because they have a lot of capabilities. So with that, I'll turn it over. Um, David, you're showing your slide preview mode and not the slideshow mode right now. Let me stop. I hope I got the right one there. Yeah, no, that's great. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. okay thank you, Tim. Uh, I would like to begin by uh, thanking everyone for uh, attending. Uh, my talk will be on safety aspects of burning of free floating oil slicks. Uh, fail safe burning by design. I'm going to begin with an overview of the presentation. I'm going to be talking about the scale of burning, uh, specifically focusing on uh, larger scales for this presentation. Um, parameters that are involved in ignition of uh, burns to facilitate and uh, start an in-situ burn process. I'll also be describing the thickness of an oil that's required and why it's important. I will be describing burning rates as they apply to different sizes of spills, as well as uh, different oil types. I will touch a little bit on herding of slicks and also ignition of herded slicks to start an in-situ burn. And I will be showing uh, some photos and some video from a large scale test I was involved with back in 2016. Uh, probably most importantly here, I'll be talking about the termination of burns, so kind of comparing uh, terminating a burn when you're using uh, herders as a containment mechanism versus a uh, fireproof burn. I'll be finishing up with some conclusions and then opening it up for questions. Now, uh, 
scaling. The scale impacts, uh, as shown on the screen here, show that we typically are seeing burn rates uh, on the range of approximately one millimeter per minute when you're dealing with very small spill or small burns, uh, 40 centimeter diameter burns. Uh, and these increase as you increase in scale up to field scale, where you could be seeing burn rates uh, up to and including uh, four millimeters per minute. In situ burn ignition, uh, as Tim has mentioned, the uh, oil layer has to be thick enough to support combustion. The problem with thin slicks is that they lose too much heat to the water layer below, and that reduces the volatilization, which uh, inhibits combustion, uh, and it won't support combustion. The ignition source has to be hot enough and applied long enough so that the uh, vapors uh, from the spill are ignited and they propagate across the, the slick. Uh, the duration, I guess, is the one caveat here that uh, I've had a lot of uh, discussions with people who haven't been that familiar with in-situ burning. And uh, I guess the appreciation here is depending on uh, how the oils are weathered, and then kind of leading into the next topic point here, uh, weathered oils will take longer to ignite than fresh oil. So your source of ignition has to uh, last for a period of time. And it may be uh, a couple of minutes before an oil will catch and continue to propagate. Another consideration here is emulsified oils. And generally speaking, uh, once the emulsion surpasses greater than about 25%, uh, some oils start having difficulties uh, in igniting and burning. There are some instances where you are able to uh, generate uh, an in-situ burn with an oil that may have a slightly higher um, water content, but a uh, quick rule of thumb is it's pretty easy uh, to start a burn uh, with an oil that will burn as long as your emulsion is less than 25%. And the final point here is uh, relatively calm conditions are typically required for herded oil combustion. Now, this last point is a really big gray area because there has been research looking at alternate uh, or enhanced weather conditions to see how far we can push the envelope to open the window for the application of herded in situ burning. And we've been seeing uh, a lot of good results. Uh, pushing that window, allowing for uh, higher wind speeds and uh, slightly rougher seas that would uh, enable us to use it as a response mechanism. <coughs> now, the oil layer thickness, um, general rule of thumb that we use is the minimum ignitable thickness for fresh crude on water is about one to two millimeters. Uh, as you start getting aged or weathered oil, uh, that thickness increases. So if you're dealing with aged unemulsified crude oil and diesel fuels, where you may have slightly uh, less uh, vapors coming off that will be easily ignitable, it's about two to five millimeters thickness. It's a higher, you can get a higher concentration of, of the vapors with a thicker oil layer. Uh, heavier residual fuel oils, uh, such as a Bunker C or number six oil uh, and emulsions, may require about uh, 10 millimeters thickness. Another general rule of thumb for larger scale spills is once you get about one square meter of burning, uh, the, the burn has been established of the, of the slick and ignition is deemed successful and it typically will propagate to areas uh, of the slick that are capable of being uh, readily burned. So what do we mean by burn rates exactly? Well, in the lab, we look at a couple of different factors. And because we're working under controlled conditions, it's relatively easy to uh, make these determinations. But it leads out into uh, field scale work as well. Uh, we basically are taking the starting volume of oil. And the uh, equation here uh, indicates the mass divided by density. Um, when we're setting up an experiment, it's uh, typically uh, done by mass of oil. Uh, 
um, just for quick calculations and we're taking the density. So we've got all the numbers kind of in our back pocket for easing this calculation, but we can get a much more precise number by uh, relying on the masses. So we take the starting mass and uh, the final mass, and the difference between those two is the quantity of oil that's been consumed. We also look at the area of the burn and the burn time. Now the extinction time, half time, is the time where uh, the oil has started to extinguish and there's about half of the area that's still burning. And the ignition half time is at the very beginning, it's the, the starting point where once the oil burn starts to propagate, you've got about half of the surface area that uh, is on fire and it's, it's propagating. But uh, that time period is generally used for calculating uh, in the lab oil burn rates. After multiple, multiple tests, we start coming up with easy rules of thumb for uh, a range of oils and oil types. So uh, we know if we're dealing with uh, a specific light oil or a medium oil or even a heavy oil and it's burning in a certain area at a certain scale, uh, we will know in advance of what an expected burn rate can be uh, based on these uh, smaller scale testing. And this works up to a certain uh, scaling enhancement. Um, part of the problem with trying to attribute uh, scaling of burn rates with uh, smaller scales is that uh, a lot of times it just doesn't work nicely. And I'll show you with the next slide here. And I'll uh, prattle off here a general rule of thumb. So for larger scale testing, when we're looking at the different oil types, gasoline can be burning, typically you're, you're expecting a burn rate of about uh, four and a half millimeters per minute when you've got a thick uh, 10 millimeter or above uh, layer. Um, Distillate fuels like diesel and kerosene, uh, it's a little, little slower at uh, four millimeters per minute. Crude oils, three and a half millimeters, and heavy residual fuels uh, down to two millimeters per minute. When the slicks are thinner, these rates are reduced. But as well, when the slicks are smaller, these rates are reduced. And again, I'll give you the uh, little reminder here with the comparison. When we were dealing with the very small scale, uh, 40 centimeter diameter burns, we were typically getting uh, burn rates around a millimeter per minute. And you compare that with uh, larger scale field scale burns where you would be expecting around three and a half millimeters per minute as a typical burn rate. Now I'll branch off quickly here into herding of slicks. Uh, again, um, start off by saying you have to have relatively calm seas and this relatively calm is the uh, gray area that I alluded to a little bit uh, ago. Um, what you wanna do is have minimizing and stretching and compaction of oil slicks. If you've got a, uh, a really rough uh, sea state, um, what'll happen is the oil may have a tendency to break down into discrete windrows, which um, although they remain contained um, with the herder, um, it may be uh, an issue getting to the contained oil or approaching uh, the contained oil uh, for ignition. But then this becomes an operational issue. It really depends on the skill set of of the people uh, who are uh, doing the operations. Um, what you wanna do is maximize the ability of the herder to affect the oil and thicken the slick. And it's just generally been shown that calmer sea conditions uh, allow this to happen more readily. So based on that, wind speed and direction are important. Uh, generally for the tests that I've been involved with, we look at uh, targeting wind speed below 10 knots, or about five meters per second. And uh, uh, in a perfect world, you're looking for non-breaking waves with uh, effectively minimal white caps. Although uh, with some of the larger scale testing that I've been involved with, we have seen uh, positive results with 
containment by herding uh, in sea states that uh, really were pushing this envelope. We were really starting to see some white caps in the area and uh, uh, the herding was still effective for the duration of the burns. Wind direction uh, is obviously an important aspect. You do not want to have um, the oil that you're herding and uh, intending to burn to be directed towards any structures or land. So geographically, it's going to be uh, something that uh, would have to be planned and, and laid out in advance. Uh, because of that, weather forecasting is going to be a critically important piece of this puzzle. You're going to want to have short-term uh, good data on expected changes to wind direction and pattern. Um, and this can help uh, identify exactly what's going to happen with the burn. Uh, cloudy or overcast skies, from an operational perspective, some of the testing that I've been involved with at a larger scale, um, if you do have cloudy or overcast skies, generally the sea itself looks a little darker. It can become harder to uh, distinguish the limits of the oil slick. And all this means is simply you're going to be relying a little more on sensors and overhead surveillance, uh, looking at uh, drones, aerostats, helicopters, or planes in order to delineate exactly where the slick is. Uh, additional work that can be performed to set up a burn, obviously, is modeling the spill behavior and fate. You want to have a good idea on the trajectory of uh, said spill. So once you have the herding aspect nailed down, we get into ignition of the, of the oil uh, to start off an in-situ burn. There's a couple of different options that are generally uh, off the shelf right now. Uh, one is a point source or a handheld igniter versus a spray delivery system, which typically incorporates the gel fuel. Uh, larger scale burns may uh, require larger scale equipment for support. Uh, if you wanna be comparing herded in situ burning with uh, traditional fire boom contained burning, um, obviously one of the pluses of trying to go the uh, herder route is the ability to get out and perform containment uh, with really minimal equipment. And that's the big, uh, big bonus, if you will, um, of going towards herded in situ burning. Um, beyond the fact that you've got uh, logistical bonuses, uh, there also is the speed enhancement that was alluded to in the earlier presentation that uh, Tim provided. So the smaller scale burns, uh, typically herded, herded oils do, do allow for smaller scale burns uh, or limit you to smaller scale burns uh, to some extent. Uh, these allow for the use of the individual handheld or remotely deployable ignition sources. Um, again, uh, using drones, UAVs or USVs, air or water based. And I know that there are some other methods that are currently under development that allow for transit uh, underwater, under ice, et cetera, to uh, allow the deposit of an ignition source um, at a remote location to uh, initiate a burn. Herded oil provides a smaller target for ignition, uh, requires perhaps a little more care in the application of the uh, igniter. Again, you must be providing sufficient heat to volatilize a portion of the slick. Uh, it may require more than a few seconds to uh, cause the oil to catch fire. Uh, multiple reignition attempts may be required, uh, depending exactly on uh, how accurate the deployment of the igniter is or uh, exactly uh, what the herded oil is doing. You may have some fragmentation uh, that may require reignition attempts to hit discrete spots of oil. And of course, uh, support equipment uh, on any sort of uh, burn is going to be a consideration. I wanted to show a couple of uh, shots 
of some work that was performed a couple of years back off the coast of Norway, work we were doing with Sintef uh, uh, under a, a large NOFO project. A shot on the left is a picture from a small man overboard boat, uh, like a, uh, a work boat, 18 or so feet long. Uh, we were deploying handheld igniters and the left photo shows where three igniters had been deposited to initiate a burn. And the photo on the right shows the burn after uh, approximately five minutes where it had uh, grown in size. Here's some additional photos uh, taken from uh, remote surveillance uh, aircraft. The one on the left shows the main uh, response boat that we were based off of. And you can see uh, just in behind the uh, smoke plume here, there's a couple of darker uh, objects. And these are the work boats that the uh, people and myself included uh, who were applying the herder around the perimeter of the deposited slick, as well as uh, launching the igniters were from. Uh, volume of oil that was released under these burns was in the neighborhood of uh, six cubic meters, 6,000 liters or 1,500 US gallons. Photo on the right shows uh, another uh, image of uh, two discrete burns that are happening simultaneously here, or two different sections of the oil that are burning. Um, and you can see uh, within the photo uh, about where I'm trying to highlight here that there appears to be a gap in the oil. Um, one of the issues that we ran into uh, portion on the bottom uh, here is the uh, one of the smaller boats and it's just showing the wake from the boat as it's uh, traversing the area. One of the issues we had after uh, the application of herder and during the application of herder was uh, a problem with being able to actually see exactly where the oil was. Um, so we were getting uh, relayed information from the uh, response vessel to help guide the uh, smaller boats and uh, there were times where the smaller boat unfortunately bisected the um, oil slick and ended up breaking it into different portions. Uh, however, in spite of this uh, setback within the test, we did manage to uh, have successful burns and I will just show you Effectively, here some video. If this is uh, showing through. This is as we were starting off one of the first burns that we were doing. And so, this was uh, one of the first successes we had. Again, we're in the open ocean, the north. Uh, off the coast of uh, Norway, between Norway and Scotland. Um, no containment boom, uh, simply herded oil. So really, if you're wanting to compare the herded in situ burning with the traditional fire boom, you can look at it as a, a batch process versus a semi-batch or continuous, where uh, a herded boom can be considered as a, a, a static, almost non-moving, really, uh, slick that is going to be uh, isolated and burned for a limited time because the quantity of oil uh, is limited. So it's going to consume uh, the finite quantity of fuel versus a traditional fire boom that can be moved through the water, uh, picking up additional oil uh, and burns can last obviously a much longer time because it continually introduces new fuel to the process. As it's burning, of course, the oil layer uh, reduces in thickness. And once the minimum thickness is reached, uh, heat ejected uh, from the uh, slick, uh, from the oil uh, to the water below becomes too great. Uh, vapors uh, start to reduce and uh, the whole system cools. It rejects a lot of heat to the water underneath and that leads to the flame self-extinguishing. At this point, 
depending on the situation, you may be uh, able to reignite portions of the uh, slick or not. There may be uh, uh, too much of it consumed. It may have uh, reached its end point. And I just wanted to show another video here another portion of, of uh, the burns as we were further along in the process. Obviously showing the uh, extent of the plume that we were dealing with, as well as the burn itself. And this is uh, perhaps about uh, 20 feet long or so, uh, six or seven meters across. Um, again, without any uh, containment other than uh, the herded oil. So how do you stop a burn? And this is probably the uh, most important safety aspect that I'd wanted to touch on here. Well, with a traditional toad uh, in-situ burn system, typically you'd have two options. One would be to drop a tow line where residual oil uh, from the burning pocket will continue to burn for a period of time anyway, but it'll spread. Uh, again, and it'll reach a point where the oil thickness will be uh, so thin that the burn will uh, not continue to be supported. Or you could accelerate, and this would lose oil uh, behind the boom, so you can shut off a lot of the oil first before either dropping a tow line or continuing uh, in a in a accelerated mode uh, with the boat, with the ship. Um, so that the oil itself is forced out of containment and you simply minimize the amount of oil that's remaining and eventually the burn will go out on its own. With a herded in situ burn, you don't have the option to directly control it. However, uh, given the research that we've been involved with and that we've seen and other people have been involved with as well, as well as the field trials, we've, we've demonstrated that Herded oils are going to burn for a limited time. And we're talking tens of minutes here. Uh, the largest burns that we were doing uh, in uh, the Norway program, we were looking at tens of minutes. Uh, grand total, of, it was less than 30 minutes anyway. Uh, and this is due to the finite quantity of fuel that was, uh, was being burned. Uh, again, once the oil layer reaches a minimum thickness, heat loss to the water becomes too great and it uh, self-extinguishes. Um, from a planning perspective, this is uh, a plus in that uh, you know once you set it up and herd an oil and you've got a track and you can uh, check wind speed direction and forecast, you know exactly how long of a window you've got before you would expect any changes to happen. Uh, you initiate ignition of the, of the burn and there's a finite quantity of uh, fuel available. Uh, so it burns over the period of time. It really is a fail-safe process based on this. Here's another couple of pictures of uh, like the final burn that we did, um, where the wind started picking up at this point. Um, you can see the plume is uh, being dragged back. It's fairly high horizontal. It's not going up. Um, when the burn was started, we were really at the back end of our window that we wanted to operate on uh, and actually surpassed it during the burn. So we did show that uh, we were able to uh, initiate and uh, maintain a burn over and a little beyond the prescribed window uh, as far as wind speeds go. Um, this burn here at the end ended up lasting there were two sections of it. Um, it was in the tens of minutes as well, but it lasted a little shorter um, in any event. Uh, the photo on the right shows uh, about a minute after termination where you can see the remainder of the plume starting to uh, drift off as well as uh, disperse into the atmosphere. So uh, a couple of conclusions that uh, have been drawn from the work. Uh, controlling of burning of spilled oil using the developed techniques and precautions is a safe, 
and in almost all situations provides positive environmental benefits that outweigh the drawbacks. And the drawbacks for any sort of in situ burn is going to be the residue and smoke. Most of the perceived risks associated with burning can be readily mitigated by following approved procedures when you're looking at technical planning and coordination of monitoring and remote sensing aspects. Uh, you have to look at the location, make sure uh, structures and people are outside of uh, determined exclusion zones, and that the weather in general is going to be within uh, threshold limits. The herded slicks uh, offer a limited quantity of fuel available for combustion, which has the direct effect of restricting, restricting the duration of burns. And this limited duration translates into limited opportunity for movement of the burning slick. So the, the danger of the burning slick getting out of control or moving into an area where you don't want it to be uh, really is uh, minimized uh, absolutely. Uh, it just really isn't a, uh, as big an issue as some people uh, may sense. If the winds pick up, the oil slick will have a tendency to stretch and thin out, which will further limit its burn time. So if the winds do pick up, um, it's not going to rapidly move the oil, the, the burning oil into another area, it will actually shorten the duration of the burn. And this has been demonstrated with the offshore burns that I've shown you involving uh, the spills of Grane Blend, uh, which lasted less than 30 minutes for each of three spills. Um, from a oil consumption perspective, uh, one workaround of the batch process being a limitation uh, of uh, consumption of oil is that you can have multiple burns conducted in a controlled batch format. Thank you. Um, I'd like to open it up for, for questions at this point. Thanks, David. That was good. That was great. We have, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take kind of the last couple of minutes of our time commitment just to preview next week. And then if people that want to stay over, we can, there's several questions to David. Um, we can answer those questions. But before we do that, let me just mention we're having work Webinar number five uh, next week and uh, same time, and I'll do a better job of not confusing people. The start time will be 9 a.m. Houston, um, and I'll make sure that the invite is, is accurate this time, so I apologize this week. Um, but next week, we're gonna have Ken Lee talk about, about the multi-partner research initiative effort that's going on right now and the plans that they have uh, for some field testing um, next year. Um, we're gonna get Melissa Partica from Sea Grant to talk about the communication activities that they are they have been undertaking for a long time to kind of communicate issues related to um, dispersants, and then we're going to get a couple of people from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Math, uh, Susan Robert, Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Sorry, Susan Roberts and Kelly Oskovic. Um, they're going to talk about uh, they're going to split their time and talk about the recent um, dispersants study that was completed um, in 2019, and then there is a new effort to do to, to um, reissue the oil in the sea um, volume that, that the National Academies um, develops and, and that's a, just recently initiated. So we'll get some information about both of those things. So I will say we're right on our time commitment at half past the hour. Um, there are several questions. So I understand if people have to go, we will collect these questions and answer them kind of through a spreadsheet so everybody can see them. But anybody that wants to stay, we usually take about 15 minutes when we've been able to get through a lot of the questions. So I'll go through um, those questions. I think everybody can see the questions. Um, but let me just look through here. Um, this one's test questions for Kelly. Did the toxicity testing focus on early life stages of aquatic species? Were they found to be more sensitive? You there, Kelly? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're kind of... Let me move it down. There okay, go. there we go. Yeah, I mean, maybe I can share my screen real quick. Sure. Oh. All right, you see the table? Yes. Okay, great. So this is the, the first table of data. Uh, so 
this is for the start. I move this out of the way so I can see this a little bit. So this is for the Celtech OP40. Um, you, you know the the the, the larval um, stage. We we do have one here for Celtech OP40. Um, we, it's just we just there's just more data out there for the the adult stages, um, but we do have one for Celtech OP40 that we found. Um, the, the endpoint was development of that larvae for the Atlantic cod. You can see here, um, and this is actually can be compared um, to, you know, in the same study um, with a, an adult version. Um, well, well, hatching actually wouldn't be an adult version, but it'd be hatching. So this is co this was conducted by the Huntsman's lab. This is the unpublished data, kind of right off the press here. Um, I haven't seen anything other than these numbers, so I haven't seen any of um, the methods. But um, but you know these these are these are you know quite comparable to 4.8 and, and the 6.8. Um, and a bit higher than the, the mortality of the, the adult inland sliver side. So that's Siltec OP40. You know, similarly we did um, I'll try to get to my other slide. Um, similar, you know, Huntsman Lab did, did uh, a similar test for the thick slick 6535 with the Lanicard larvae um, and compared that to, you know, one for the hatching endpoint. So here the, the endpoint development for the larvae, you know, was, you know, quite lower than the, than the hatching endpoint, um, you know, 94 compared to, to 400. So we are seeing some, some you know, some sensitivities for the, the early life stages there. And those were the only ones that, um, that I found so far with, with the early life stages. Okay. All right, this next question, it looks like it's for David. As the oil is burned, is the slick continuing to contract due to the presence of herder? Um, short answer is probably. Um, Generally speaking, herders will have a, uh, a strong window of effectiveness for about an hour after application. Um, the herding will begin to relax after that point as the components migrate into the actual oil uh, itself and the difference between the surface tension of the water and the oil begins to diminish a little bit. However, at the same time that burning is happening, you do have almost like a, a pseudo chimney effect where air is being drawn in due to the, the heat rise from the burn. So you have a natural kind of convective uh, uh, air movement that helps uh, herd the oil at the same time. So in some of the uh, testing and the results that we've seen, we did have uh, burns, some of the burns lasting longer than we had anticipated given the volumes of oils that we were dealing with and the presumption is uh, the ongoing impact of continued herding allowed the oil to, uh, even though the surface area on the, on, uh, may be diminishing, the thickness was still there. So the, the burn continued to occur over a longer time period. So Herding is still happening. Uh, the question is what's causing it to continue to happen, whether it's uh, the herder itself or uh, the ingress of air around the base of the fire or a combination of the two. Um, I can't definitively say what's winning that battle. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I just, I'd say you're right, right? It's the, but the wind herding, we know that wind herding happened during Deepwater Horizon, right? There was some burns that continued for oil that escaped, and there was no herder, right? The oil that escaped the fire boom. So some of the, so there was some burns that continued to happen, right? And it's kind of amazing, and David's seen this, but in his video showed it, but but I've seen it even more dramatic, right? That a, a five millimeter thick slick of oil that's fully engulfed in flame can have fingers of fire that they go 40, 50 feet in the air, right? And so the convective currents that are necessary to keep that fed are significant, right? It, it, if you were standing there, it would be windy. And so this wind herding in, in combination with both the herder and the reduction in the viscosity of the oil as it heats up, um, 
I think combines to allow us, as I said, there's field tests where we get 90 plus percent burn efficiency when we'd expected to have 70, you know, 70 to 80 percent burn efficiency. And it, it had to be a combination of those. But I think the wind hurting has an important effect as well. All right, next question. The old question about ferrocene, David, if you want to answer that or I can answer it. Would public acceptance be enhanced if the smoke was suppressed with ferrocene? Uh, I can, why don't I start off and by, by simply saying uh, that's likely true. Um, public acceptance uh, would increase because the smoke itself would uh, appear to be and, and would be uh, effectively diminished. There would be diminished uh, creation of particulates. You would lose a lot of the black sootiness of the, of the plume. Um, and in doing so, it looks uh, a lot less um, detrimental to the environment uh, because of that. Yeah, I just suggest that I'm not sure public is, you know, during Deepwater Horizon, there wasn't a big outcry on the in situ burning, right? It was far offshore. And so there was, you know, the news might show it, but I, so, in, so I'm not sure the public outcry is that, is that significant because our one event where we had incident of in situ burning and there wasn't a big public outcry. Now that may be because there was a bigger boogeyman, I argue, than the dispersants were once the bigger boogeyman during Deepwater Horizon and that got all the public attention. And if in situ burning was only the only option, then maybe the the smoke plume would be a would be a big public issue. But that's kind of a subjective issue. And I'd argue that being far, you know, keeping the safety protocols in place and making sure the winds are the right direction, you're far enough away from any sensitive um, areas that uh, we can do in situ burning safely. And so it, it's a perception issue. I say that ferrocene isn't the solution because uh, what we can't do, you know, anything that complicates oil spill response makes it, it's already extremely challenging thing to do, right? And so the idea of let's just spray, let's burn and then spray ferrocene on it makes it that much more, you know, makes it an order of magnitude more complicated compared to just using herders, right? Because uh, so now you got to bring this whole additional thing out there and spray it on the slicks. Um, that I think it makes it impractical. And I think that's kind of the conclusion from the previous work on ferrocene, that it does make the smoke appear less dark, but uh, it's, it's, it adds a, com a completely additional kind of logistical challenge that I, I'm not sure is, is justified. And it's maybe education is a better path than, than ferrocene. Okay, all right. Is there a difference in the burn residue composition and or smoke composition from herder initiated burns versus fire burn? Uh, the short answer here is, uh, I'll, I'll mention a slight difference. Um, I've seen some studies that look at the uh, components of the smoke, res uh, smoke uh, as well as residue. Um, studies that I've seen used uh, far in excess, here's a little caveat here, far in excess uh, concentrations of herder than would normally be used during uh, a typical herd and in situ burn operation. So uh, a lot of herder was used and there was uh, detection of herder compounds in the smoke as well as in, in some of the residue. Now, how bad is the herder is the other question. Um, Kelly talked a little bit about the um, toxicity and the, the biodegradation of the, the two uh, target compounds that are currently uh, at use of, or, or able to be used anyway uh, in the U.S. Um, it's probably not a big deal, generally speaking. Um, I, I really don't see that as being an issue, to be honest. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I'd say the smoke composition, I, the her, there's a question about where the herder, you know, where the herder goes, right? The herder is spreads kind of far away, right? There's some very small amount that might be next to the fire that might, that might have enough heat so that it could volatilize, but it'd be such low concentrations. Um, but I don't think the smoke plume would be that much difference. I would say that maybe the residue could be different, right? Because of a fully not fundamentally different, but just more concentrated, right? Because the residue from a boom-based burn, if, if you do a fully loaded fire boom, 
the amount of oil at the apex of that fire boom, it, you could have 12 inches thick of oil, right? If you run that operation correctly and you fully load the fire boom, you could have 12 inches or more. The, the thickness of the, of the oil layer is, is, is consistent with the thickness of the skirt of the boom um, before you start losing entrainment under the boom, right? So you can have a really thick layer. That means that you're still gonna burn down to this one millimeter thick if you run everything correctly. And so you're gonna have 99 plus percent burn efficiency potentially, right? Which means that the residue is much more concentrated in, in, uh, in, uh, in the heavy asphaltines and tars and resins and things that didn't, right? So it, it's, it's gonna be a, kind of a much more kind of viscous tarry mat, asphalt mat um, that may probably has a higher likely of sinking in fact than you would from, in, from a further burn just because you, you only get 90% burn efficiency, right? So you don't get as much concentration of these non-volatile components in the oil. Um, what else do we have here? And one thing to mention too is just the, you know, I wanted to highlight the biodegradation data. Um, you know, we do have some data, the following OECD methods, the, the 301 F looking at the, the ultimate biodegradation of, of thick slick and Siltec. And uh, after 28 days, you know, thick slick was 100% biodegraded uh, to carbon dioxide. Um, the, the, the Siltec OP40, um, you know, with the, the silicone in there, um, a little bit slower biodegradation uh, with, you know, 33% um, ultimately biodegraded after, after 28 days. So with the biodegradation into account and, and the dilution, you know, I, you know, I, I would agree that, you know, the, the small amount of, of herders that's left after the in-situ burning um, you know, wouldn't be persistent in the environment. Okay, I'm looking at new questions here. Does the pyrogenic residue sink? Is it collected? David, you wanna? Uh, short answer to that is some of the residues will sink. Uh, some, will, some will remain floating. Uh, typically, you would target to try to collect the residue uh, in some circumstances if uh, you're unable to get to it quickly enough and it, it does have a tendency to sink, it will sink. Now the general thoughts on the residue is uh, that the toxicity of what's left is going to be a lot less than the starting oil. Uh, it's unfortunate that it would sink. However, the net benefit of having rendered it less toxic uh, makes it less of a concern. Um, that's the general scuttlebutt. I don't know, Tim, if you've got- Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. I, I just suggest that maybe residue from uh, herders are, are maybe less likely to seek sink than the same residue from a uh, fire boom because you just, you know, 99% burn efficiency means that the residue is gonna be that much more concentrated in the heavier compounds than the than the herder, but I think that, you know, the evidence indicates that about 50% of the oil slicks, the residues sink in 50% of them, okay, and, and the, the, the kind of environmental issue of those are smothering mainly, right, it's the, not, not necessarily toxicity, because as, as we discussed, the toxic components were lost. Yeah, it's the yeah. physical effects on, on the critters yeah. on the bottom. Yeah. Um, how do, this is for you, Kelly, how do LC50 values of herders compare with those for dispersants? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I actually haven't looked at the LC50 values for dispersants in, in quite a, quite some yeah, I time. Can, so well, I, I, can, uh, I can answer that one, actually. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, so we have actually added on my slide. But if we compare thick slick, which is what we'd recommend as the herder to use, um, and the LC50 for the target organisms that are used by the EPA for listing, and we compare that to the the same organisms for and, and test with core eggs at 9,500. The LC50s are about an order of magnitude less. I'm sorry, they're order of magnitude higher, which means that L the, the LC50s, the acute toxicity to those two organisms for thick slick is about an order of magnitude lower, right? So, so that means the organism could accept a higher dosage before they start keeling over. Um, so the LC50 for thick slick means that the thick slick is those two organisms is is about an order of magnitude less toxic than core eggs at 9,500. So it has these kind of, as I said, it has these good environmental 
um, characteristics in that it is biodegradable. Thixalic is biodegradable. It's less toxic than comparable disper you know, dispersants that we commonly use. And it's used at 10 times or even 100 times less loading compared to what we do with spring. Yeah. Here's a question for you, David. Um, do you know of a model for the smoke plumes from in situ burning? You know, that's, that's one area that's outside of my expertise. Yeah, I, so I, I saw a talk a few weeks ago, well, a few months ago now. It's hard to remember how much time's flying here in the lockdown, but the USGS, a guy from the USGS described some modeling that he did for some offshore burns. And so they have, they had a smoke, you know, a plume model for air plume model that was, uh, that was used. So I think, I think there is more than, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's multiple models. I don't know the exact, I can't remember the exact name of the model that he used, but there are models out there. Right, and we've done work in the past looking at burns that, and had uh, US EPA, I forget what region they were out of, um, but they had come with a, a monitoring package that was uh, measuring uh, a few components that were in the, in the smoke flume. And uh, I know they were going to be model it, modeling uh, the results. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm not sure of the exact model that they were using. So there, there are multiple models out there and available um, but again, I'm not an expert, uh, in, in smoke plume modeling and, and, uh, the name of the model, they told me it was, and it, the name escapes me. Yeah. Maybe we can provide that, you know, um, I, we can get some, yeah. sure. get these questions here. If we do. I know, I, I know the, guy, some I know the guy's name. I've actually communicated with him so we can get a model to use. Um, well, we've, I think, unless you guys saw a question or something that I missed, I, I just wanted to, to bring up another point that hasn't been mentioned here. There's, there's been an awful lot of talk about the uh, differences between the OP40 and the Fixlick 6535 from an environmental perspective. Um, looking at uh, it purely from, from that lens, uh, why wouldn't you use Fixlick all the time? Well, there is a performance difference with different oils with these two herders. Some oil herder combinations work better than others. So there are instances where you would want to look at OP40 uh, because its performance is uh, noticeably greater than Fixlick. As well, the OP40 works at uh, lower temperatures. Mm -hmm. It's able to uh, withstand um, water temperatures getting down really close to uh, the zero degree uh, area. So from the work that I've been involved with, looking at cold weather conditions, yes, there's kind of pluses and minuses to both. Um, that being said, we've been involved in an awful lot of testing of, of herders and oils. Uh, I'd say testing into the thousands of tests. Generally speaking, uh, in more temperate, temperate climate uh, conditions, you're getting better performance out of uh, out of herders. So it is kind of disheartening, Tim, when you mentioned that uh, um, your desire to have some uh, herding uh, incorporated into uh, some of the uh, uh, trials or, or tests that uh, you were uh, trying to get them involved with were declined because of the lack of uh, information about temperate testing of herders. Yeah. Uh, there, there, there is a lot of data uh, that has been generated behind the scenes and the, the, the general uh, rule of thumb that we use is that uh, in, in warmer temperatures, you're going to be getting better performance out of them than yeah. results at the colder temperatures. And I just wanted to lay that out. Yeah, no, I appreciate that because that was a specific question that was asked in that drill. And, and uh, you know, the body of research is probably 95% of the work's been done in ice-free temperate conditions and 5%. But the research that had been published in the last decade uh, or since 2005, at least, has is, is focused on the application for ice, and that's what was in the top of people's minds. So I, I have, it's great. I mean, I constantly try to reinforce that it is an open water technique, and in fact, it would probably work better at the equator than it would at the at the North Pole, right? If you do it. So, well, I appreciate you guys, and so thanks for giving these presentations. I was, I think. They're very interesting, and I think uh, this is a really interesting topic, so I really enjoy talking about it. If anybody has any other questions, feel free to send me an email, and we can get them to uh, Kelly and David um, to get them answered. We'll, we'll, we'll collect the questions that we answered. I think we've got to all of them. 
um, but we'll look over them again and add some additional information and send out the spreadsheets with those questions. Um, so thanks again. Thanks everybody who, who tuned in and uh, we'll talk again uh, next week. Thanks guys. Thanks everybody. Thank